Um, I'm not sure uh, whether or not you are understanding everything that's going on. I know that um, some people have come saying that they've been having very serious issues, and the more we've gotten to the end part of this course, the harder, the more impenetrable it seems. Um, so, this is to remind you that it is not as impenetrable as it seems, and that every moment we need, any time it seems too complex, we need to take stock and back up and think about it. The course is called Untimely Meditations because it is trying to break away from chronos, from chronologic time. It's trying to break away from time that is uh, sort of linear, that is continuous. It's trying to rethink uh, how meaning is established with patterns and with uh, nuances. And so we've gone from the sort of a Nietzsche and Heideggerian move to uh, Leotard, really, or Deleuze um, and Leotard, and then hopefully today we'll get into Gödel and Hofstetter. And if in maybe we'll do a little more for Genesis, but I think that that would be quite quite useful. <laughs> the thing you sent to you now. <coughs> um, so I guess my first question to you is how do you understand the word rhizome? Is that, does that make sense? Just so, so when you hear the word, I mean, I'm trying to get, where are we failing on the leotard moment? Because I know leotard becomes a bit of a, a dark, you know, the dark lord or something. It becomes very difficult. This is a difficulty with only a few students. We can also turn the lights down if you can yeah. My, when, when you say rhizome, I think I get rhizome. And what but is it? What is the rhizome? Rhizome is the... Um, I thought about this so Okay, the, ry the rhizome is the... Um, is different. Is a way of constructing concepts and connecting them um, by virtue of changes of nature um, by allowing abstraction to connect heterogeneous principles, but not in a manner that their um, relationships are simply rerouted to form a new totalizing concept, but more, more that they map actually the relationships and associations of the concepts, and therefore expose the concepts for how they actually behave themselves, and therefore interpret them as they connect and thus separate them to that matter. So does it have to refer to a concept, the rhizome? The, the rhizome itself, no. In this, in this, what, the, the rhizome, no. Because the way you described that, you were saying that it's basically connecting concepts in different ways. Yeah, it connects concepts, but... Um, but can it connect anything in a different way? Yeah. It, yes. Can I tell you, it can accept anything in a different way. It doesn't have to be concept because a concept is. So that doesn't seem like a very useful. Why? Yeah, of course it's useful. Okay, we're gonna go over to Lily. Lily, what's a rhizome? What do you think a rhizome is? Uh, what's a what is it rhizome in the Deleuzian use of it? It's the the way something connects with something else. So the something that connects with something else is a concept? I want to say yes, I think it is a concept. But it's basically removing the outer edge of the concept. Rather than saying it's two separate things which are linked by an external spring, it means that the two things become not necessarily one thing, but another thing by being connected. Okay, Fred? What's a rhizome in your mind? It's a multiplicity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so does it have to connect the concepts? No, not so much. The co uh, connections can form anywhere. There doesn't have to be a similarity for a connection to form. You can just Closer. Form. You can't. It's not. It doesn't. It can't. I don't think it connects concepts because it's... Concept requires cognition. And the idea of rising is that there isn't cognition. It's right. a way of being. Good. 
say you just so if that's the case then what does that mean for a concept nothing so what does the concept become if there's no yeah. thing as cognition yeah so how do you get meaning via the y zone it's what comes together at the right time at the right place it's making sense it's making sense it's not but that then does that become conceptual Okay, so how does it matter, or does it matter? So we started off by, by David explaining the heterogeneic features of connecting an X with a Y, but it was done by a conceptual move. And Lily, you, you kind of enlarged on that a little bit, mm -hmm. but explained that that connection didn't have edges to it. Mm -hmm. And then you were, uh, Fred, you were saying, well, there's a multiplicity involved with that connection. But in, and then and and then Dora, you also were agreeing with this notion of multiplicity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now we have something thrown into the mix that basically says that there's a that there's no there's no there's no cognition. <coughs> so what does that do to a concept? It can't be a concept. Then. Okay. So what is it? It's all. No. This is why you said it's a kind of event. It can be an event. Okay. Encounter. Yes. It's a plan. So all these things happen in it. Happening. So happening. Okay. Fred? I don't want to say the word. Don't you don't want to say the word. probably wrong. Difference. No. Could be difference. Yeah. Oh, she, it's becoming, isn't it? That's what it's about. Um, because the reason it because because it's always becoming. Okay. Um and no go. No no. You like your about says. Well, okay. Um the word is okay, you will want to say on one level it's a concept. But actually there's a thing called is. The reality of this thing called is. The is the present. Now the present is a concept, but it's also not a concept. It's also the here and now. So it's a spatial, temporal moment. So the rhizome is naming the boundaries of this is, or it's, it's, it's suggesting how the boundaries of the is get established. Does that make sense? Does that sentence make sense? Because if it doesn't, we, we, cause we can't get to ghetto until you get that section. So is that, is that Tied down, is that like nodded? I got it, but we'll just say it again just to make sure. Fred, do you want to say it again? Uh, the uh, the rhizome constructs the boundaries of the is. And how does rhizome construct a boundary as it is? If we were using that special word that started with a B, ended with a G. Becoming. Yes. So what is this about the what is it about a rhizome? What what literally is the rhizome? I mean, it's unfortunate. This the plant. It's plant. Yeah. yeah. But what does it do? Propagation. <coughs> and it propagates. It propagates in all directions. And it propagates without a root. It propagates without, without a ground. Root, yes. All okay. ground. No ground. No ground to the rhizome. So think about it this way. So the is has no ground. Face. Or a y. Why are you making a face? Why, why is that problematic? Are you okay with the notion of ground? Or the groundless ground? What does groundless ground mean? The, the band. <laughs> what there okay. is without, well, the, when there's no taking away, it's hard to say without my favorite contact word. Which is your contact word? It's, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've been forbidden to say it. <laughs> <coughs> I pass it on. Go for it, Fred. <laughs> I'd like to 
hear what Amrit thinks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Amrit. What was the, what are we? What is the question? <laughs> what is around this ground? Come on in. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Luckily, Emily wasn't here earlier. <laughs> Okay. Do you Is notice anything broken? different? Do you notice anything different? Is it okay? Yeah. He told oh, me he put his foot through it. <laughs> yeah, no one put their foot. Did you hear us? Is that what happened? No, no. Okay, no. good. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Again, camera. So, the, the question, okay. I'm going to backtrack. I'm going to backtrack because I know this is really hard for you and I, I'm trying to get you not to get too lost in this, but it's tough stuff, so I get that it's been tough. Isn't the ground as ground that is? Isn't it what proliferates and is happening at the time? So what does a ground do? What, what, what do you think a ground's supposed to do? Gives a reason for being. Yeah. And when you lose your grounding, when you lose your compass, as it were, you lose your orientation. You don't know what you're doing, right? Isn't that true? I mean, you know, um, we had somebody staying over at uh, the house, uh, this lovely guy, uh, Ron Broglio, uh, who lives in Arizona, and he's a runner, and he decided to run, and then he saw this, like, very interesting little part in the desert, um, so he thought he'd just go off the path, and he went off the path, and then he couldn't figure out how to get back on the path. He, and he literally had, there was desert in all directions. And that's pretty freaky. And he had a liter of water on him and no communication, except his, his phone was a compass, that was it. So he just decided to run north because that's, that gave him a direction. So, you, <laughs> like Jesus is king. Actually, obviously he's alive, so he figured out how to do that. But, um, a ground gives you a purpose, it gives you a direction, it gives you a way forward, it's a method, it's, a, it's something that can come into what you're doing. That's a ground. And, but the, the problem has been that in order to really think about art and sex and rock and roll and drugs and any of the things that are ephemeral, or that seem to be ephemeral without just making it up. You need to have something that can give a direction without forcing a position. Hence you need what is called a groundless ground. So this half of the course has all been focusing on how do you get this groundless ground to work? What, what makes it work? And so Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari in particular come up with this notion of the rhizome, which is literally something that goes along the surface, but doesn't technically put down roots, although we know it's a complete lie, and anybody that's a gardener has issues with the rhizome, as I have been told many times by a person I live with who is a gardener. <laughs> Eats it. Hates rhizomes. <laughs> anyway, um, not all rhizomes. But, so the, the point is, is that you have this surface, and the surface creates the moment of an is. And your surface can be anything. It can be your canvas. It can be your ideas that you grasp to bring to yourself. It can be whatever it is that ends up creating your path. But if you really think about it, it's not just anything that can work. It's not like you can just grab anything and, and hope it works. Because it's not going to work. The, the, the ground is not going to be, uh, sorry, the, the path cannot establish itself unless there's something that is, enables it to create a meaning. So either it's going to create a meaning by having the dialectic, the unified totalizing concept with the ground, which we gotten rid of for this semester, or it's going to do it in this rhizomatic way that, but if you thought about it, if everything was just going in all different directions, it's just multiplicity, 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 you wouldn't be able to come up with anything. You'd just be in this big vat. It wouldn't 
give you anywhere to go. So that's why it's not really about concepts per se. No. So be careful. So it's, change about <coughs> it's, 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 it's about intensities. It is about intensity, but it's about a very specific kind of intensity. This we have not not into leotard yet. So just with Deleuze and Guattari. So, so what they're saying is that there's this way in which you have um, an encounter. I think that's what Jess was. Somebody said the name was Jess. That enables you to begin to produce the is. The is is produced. It, it's not something you come upon. Now, to understand that the is is produced, to understand that sentence in that way, you need to understand what a groundless ground does. It gives you direction, without, it gives you a map without giving you an exact rule to follow. <coughs> now we're going to move, I'm going to put a little thing into Gödel, G-O-D-E-L, two little things over the O. Gödel came, Gödel made an amazing breakthrough, which is why you were asked to look at him and, and Hoff said, oh, I'm not sure if anybody even had a minute to look at the stuff on Zen and Monk and various, oh, you did? I did. What did you think? I, I really like the Zen. Yeah, uh, the cones. Yes, yes. The no gate. Oh, it was, it was fantastic, actually. I really enjoyed that because it's about not never actually getting it. Yeah. So yeah. You're you always trying to work towards that a moment of something. Yes. But you're never actually going to and you're not meant to. And you're not meant to and that's partly because there is no answer. So there's but that doesn't mean that one can't approach it. That now, now yes. I was gonna say I haven't read this enough to confess. But is this about the book Gateless Gate? Because I've read that. Is this about what? The Gateless Gate is a Zen book. Is yeah. That cool. Is yeah. that what he refers? Because I've read. Well, that. it's one of the monks in there. Okay, good. That's that's nice. I know something about. <laughs> anyway, so you have the situation where you have this non-answer as your answer. So think about that. What does it mean to have a non-answer that's an answer? I mean, um, not to keep bringing it back to questions of um, suicide. But I always think that, you know, this, I feel like this is my mission now to always say something that's important about it. So the other day, I was with uh, who I call the Pope, which is the guy I see, um, he looks like Pope Francis, and I tell him he's the Pope, and he, I don't know what he thinks of this. <laughs> it was a lunatic, basically. And he, uh, you know, and he, he says to me all the time, because I say to him, you know, I just, do not understand. I mean, I understand on one level depression, troubles, things that are worrying one, but on the other hand, I simply don't understand. And I don't understand the violence of suicide, of this particular brother's suicide hanging. I don't understand it. And he was like, you will never understand it. And I felt like he was me talking to me, as I talking to you guys, where he's going, you'll never understand this, and it's not a problem, it's okay that you don't understand it, you know, and I'm sitting there going, but I want to understand it, you know, and it's like, and he's saying to me, there's nothing for you to actually understand, because it's not about understanding, it's not about cognition, I started laughing, I said, really, it's not about recognition, said, no, it's like you're encountering this, I said, you have got to be kidding me, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> free me from my, myself, anyway, um, but it, he had a point, there is nothing that is to be understood because it's not understandable. Because the only person who has the answer, if there even is an answer, is the person who's not alive. So there's no answer. That doesn't mean you don't keep asking every minute of the day, could it have been otherwise? Why? What's involved? How does it, you know? And what that does, what I found that it does in asking that kind of question and like being very raw about it, is that a lot of the bullshit sort of falls away. A lot of the stuff that is in your life that, you know, takes up your time, you know, and you get annoyed about or freaked out about, just sort of goes somewhere else. Because what you're <coughs> actually doing is inhabiting this very radical thing that we have names for. Sometimes we call it difference. Sometimes we call it, like, the knot of the something. You know, helpful. Maybe it's just raw. But it creates this is 
this burning, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be suicide that makes you think about this, but there are other things that can make you think about this, that can make you understand it. And one of the things, it's not just suicide, it's your artwork, which can have the same burning energy. There's no answer to your art. If someone said, what is your art really about? No, really, tell me, you know. It's all very interesting, what's it really about? Well, really, the answer is, it's not about anything. It's not a, it's, the question, what is it about, is not what it's about. That's the wrong question. And at the same time, it's, it it's completely appropriate to ask that question. So, I go back and I, I say to you, this notion of the gut encounter as opposed to your mental encounter, the rawness of the encounter, this is what Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari and Leotard are trying to get at. And yes, we can talk about it as intensity. We can talk about it as, you know, uh, sort of the horizon, but when you are living it, and you all are living this, first of all, most of you have confronted death in one way or another. Most of you have been in situations where you've had to leave your family, your home, your country, or something, and it creates these little deaths. You know, I don't know anybody in this room, if not anywhere else, that if you're going to proceed as an artist, that you don't just somehow know this weird relationship. And, and that it is very destabilizing, and at the same time, it gives you a bizarre direction. It's not a direction that you actually understand, but you can go sort of forward with it, or you can go somewhere with it, or maybe the word is becoming. So it's this notion of the is that is alive, but not tellable, not sayable. Now that's helpful up to a certain point, but I can assure you, at least in my situation, not all that helpful. You know? And so we have to keep digging a little bit, because really, what is your art about? What is contemporary art? Why does it include sex, drugs, rock and roll? But it doesn't really include sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But at the same time, you want to say, well, yeah, well maybe it does. I mean, if you look at anybody's work, and maybe it looks completely abstract, I'm thinking of Pollock, let's say, you know, just picture any Pollock in your head, you know, so you get a sense. What, why does that, why could that easily be said that that is all sex, drugs, rock and roll? That the, that the notion of representation has nothing to do with that, that work. And even if you see images, figures, like in here, it has nothing to do with that work. Because contemporary work requires that you understand this role of the is, this living, raw, not explainable, not cognizable role. And yet, there is a logic to it. And the logic, Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari want to call a logic of sense. Mm -hmm. And once you can really grasp this, this is what Leotard is talking about, this is what they're all banging on about. This thing about intensity, you know, uh, the libidinal band, um, you know, notions of libidinal economy, all of that is all about how this energy gives you this direction. Now, sometimes it's a malign energy. Sometimes it's a pain so searing that you just, you know, you just think you're not going to be able to breathe. And sometimes it's just boring. That's also a sense. Sometimes you're bored, or, or in fact, one is bo boring. You know, I don't know if anybody's ever felt that they were boring. <laughs> now, now, you're not allowed to answer because you're doing your PhD thesis. Yeah, boy, <laughs> that's right. But, but you know, when you feel like, you, you know, literally, you feel like that's who am I? I am boring. You know, or this horrible thing I see in the the um, tubes these days. I am train. I don't know if you've, have you have you seen this? It's like, what is that? It's like, oh yeah, I am train. You know, it's just like I just. I feel like saying, okay, where's the bird? <laughs> okay. you, know, you know, where's the jaron? I am trained. 
I heard all these commuters, and I'm commuting a lot, I heard all these commuters going, who didn't speak English very well. They're going, but what does it mean I am train? People were looking it up, you know, like, what does it mean? But the train, the train, you know, are you a train? It was like, it's like, it's just bad, it's bad, just ignore it. <laughs> I am headache. <laughs> it's like, I am annoyed. Um, anyway, what we're trying to get at here is this relationship of raw as a guiding feature, as something other than just this grand sort of gesture to, I don't know, the senses, the body. So what, what, what Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari are trying to do is to put this in a logical environment. And they do this in part by going off on a whole argument around plane of imminence, around the nodal points, around zero and one. That gets them so far. In our course, we're moving over to, or re trying to bring in the question then, of, without trying to, to be too intellectualized, that if this is about the question of difference, and how difference becomes the famous groundless ground, and by difference we mean this raw inhabitance of the that which is but really isn't, but sort of is, but, and also the sort of, the perhaps, <coughs> the maybe. Because when you think about dialectics, you often think about yes or not yes. You know, the, the dualisms. Yes, no, right, wrong, black, white, girl, boy, this kind of thing. And we know that that is not enough. It's not even partly enough. So we try to change this and get into this question of queer. This is the, the beginning of renaming the division. Not so much that there's one division called queer, but that queer names the heterogeneity of multiplicity. But to do that systematically, one turns to Gödel, this very conservative, highly improbable person to help. He's this odd mathematician, who I think that Dane could probably say a word or two about. Yeah, he was born in 1981. Okay, more than a word. As a child, he was called Mr. White, because he always asked why. Why do why, why things do this, do that? His parents got annoyed with him. Um, he was part of the logical positivist circle in Vienna, being like the cultural hotspot of the 1920s. Logical positivists <coughs> were a group of people that tried to throw out the, the rubbish of mathematics and logic philosophy and just focus on constructing a system which could provide the answers to anything. So it, was, it didn't require meaning, meanings were thrown out as well, that's just metaphysical rubbish. Man. It's just, you, need, you needed a system which acted as a machine. <coughs> Where things like this is with you that plus minuses, little squiggles for uh, knots, they, they didn't have any meaning per se. They, they were just meaningless marks on paper. And they, were, they were like cogs or gears in a machine. You know, a cog or a computer chip doesn't mean anything, it just does something. And that, that was. Which is why it's called functionalism. And positive, it's a function. Po yeah. Positivism that. It avoids negation in a sense. It's a positive philosophy. It doesn't sound very positive in that same sense. And Talk about boring. Mm, they always made this cut between theory and data. You have the theory, the model, which you apply to the data. And the, the two don't mix. They're always completely distinct. And they're all. Yeah, they, their quest was to find this complete system. And logic. may I just introduce a very good summary right there? Uh, that still haunts people today in art schools in particular, but not just art schools, where people really think that theory explains the practice, it's not embedded in the practice, that you need to, you know, that theory is in fact a model that you apply, and that it's only in a very few places that gets away from that. This is one of those places, for good or for ill, you know, so that the theory and the practice are intertwined. Or inha you inhabit it. So, you, yeah, so go on. Uh, so. so but the core thing about him, what when he had his eureka moment, 
Mm -hmm. Studying these systems of ones for these positivists, he eventually came up with using this system that the Principia Mathematica system was a system devised by Bertrand Russell and Albert Brook, North Whitehead, which claimed to have completed this system. It had two features. It was complete in the sense that it, it could express any mathematical function and consistent in that it never contradicted itself. So, And this was considered very important for knowledge. So you could, it of stable stability. Yeah. So in the same system you couldn't say 2 plus 2 equals 4 and 2 plus 2 equal, does not equal 4. It was always a right answer in a sense. And what Gödel showed by using this system and manipulated it to a very extreme in a very, very extreme direction by introducing what David Hilbert called meta mathematics, which is using a system to talk about itself without going outside the system. So you could say 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a mathematical theorem, but you don't have to go outside the system to say, oh yes, I can do that now and say it is a mathematical theorem. You can state it within, without. So it delimits the idea of inside and outside, the idea of there being a metaphysical framework which you can apply and to And what is the word meta in metaphysical? It's, technically it's, it's the, the beyond. That there's a beyond which grants order it comes from this translation. Yes, right. <laughs> yes. Problems, but Gödel used this system to talk about the system itself and he showed that you can Using meta mathematics, you can Im simple mathematics. Meta mathematics, you can embody any forms of discourse into this system. So you can talk about maths or science or anything that anything that can be coded. It's the precursor to the digital computer. That a computing can be coded to do any number of things. He showed that this sort of system can be coded to do a number of things. That, when pushed to an extreme, it produces. Uh, and what's called an undecidable statement. So that it, the system can construct a statement which says this statement is not a provable system in the Principia Mathematica system, essentially. And which would go against the Principia Mathematica, mm. since it was supposed to be having everything that could be provable. Mm. And it's yeah, it, it's essentially a paradox. Like the yeah, the above saying, this sentence is a lie. It's <coughs> the empedocles yeah. paradox. Um, the, the preceding, the below sentence is false. The above sentence is true. So, and the consequence of that is that a system can either, can either be complete and inconsistent, so it can incorporate everything, but it also incorporates contradictions as well, which is which a was problem. The it's not much of a system if, if it can incorporate 2 plus 2 plus 4 and 2 plus 2 does not equal 4. It's just a, a nonsense system, essentially. Mm. And so wait, before you go on, does everybody get why this is important? Does everybody, because if, if, if the key here, it, let's say in Burton Russell's uh, Principle of Mathematica, was to say that, that the most important form of a system is that things can be systematized, therefore there can be rational knowledge, therefore it's a, it's a very specific type of the enlightenment, you know, where the mind and the intellect is king, this kind of thing. And then to find there's a system, a meta-system, that if you take it to its so-called logical conclusion, not only can it prove everything, it can pr prove everything that it's not as well which is kind of unbelievable. In fact, it is completely unbelievable. So this notion of, of the fact that there can always be a decision made was uprooted by using the very system that relied on decisions. And it's the same system that everyone here in commonsensical land uses. So the decision, which is seen as the, the god of our time, make a decision. Why can't you make a decision? Make a decision. The argument was, and what he proves, is that actually the only decision you can make is an undecidable decision. And that even in itself sounds crazy. 
It's, it's, it, it, in other words, it's an open or incomplete or undecidable position. By the way, when you were handing in your ba basic papers to the powers that be in this university, people kept trying to correct your word, undecidable. Mm. And they said, you know, it's not undecidable, it's indecisive. I said, no, it's undecidable. <laughs> that is the word. Mm. <laughs> anyway, so, just sorry. Um, so, if something's undecidable, you have to understand the profundity of this. It doesn't mean that you're wandering around going, I can't make a decision. <laughs> it's that that's not the question. Just the same question <coughs> as, or the same problem as, why, why, why is there a suicide? It's not going to yield any answer. It's not. And so what you need to do is figure out how to handle that fact. The fact of the undecidable. The fact of the of the of the groundless ground. There's or, consistency, but there's consistency, but it, it doesn't. Can't be completed. There's consistency, but it can't be completed and can never be completed. And when you throw in the mix, the rawness, the blood, the the colors, the uh, tambra, there are certain groups that want to call this, and we're part of this group, queer. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that that's going to last. I don't even know if it will or not, uh, in a kind of you know, boring sense. My sort of way in, because I was very conservative about these ways of presenting it, was to call it just radical matter. But Henry being Henry said, no, 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 no. What you're doing is queer theory. I was like, queer theory is identity politics. I don't do that, you know. <laughs> I don't know. But I realized, actually, there's something to be said about this. There's something to be said about this heterogeneic way. Once you bring the body into it, anybody, like not just anybody, but anybody, <coughs> sentient or otherwise, you start having this undecidable thing going on that creates consistencies, but at the same time doesn't answer anything. Make sense so far? Or, yeah, Mattia? Uh, diversity is important to. to uh, to add to, to this picture that Dale gave, that the preoccupation of a positive approach to logic, which is the same preoccupation that is um, the one to make sense on the top of the graph, yes. moving from the concept. <coughs> but was that, in the case of logic, one would start thinking from axiom, from given accepted starting points, bricks of reasoning. Mm -hmm. Uh, if the best examples are the axioms of geometry. Point has no dimension, say line has got one dimension, surface has got two, solid has got three, and parallels never meet. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem that was faced by um, uh, the, the Hilbert and the others was that they, they had to make sure at the same time that these statements would not contradict each other among them as a starting point. And all the possible combination into the future would also not contradict each other. So if one could construct the first layer combination and it should be sound, consistent, and usable, and then combination of combination, combination of combination of combination, all the way to infinity would continue to create this smooth surface without contradictions, without holes in it. And that was the dream they had. And what Gödel is able to find in more supply numbers, not on genetic axioms, is that you always reach at some point statements or theorems developing these things, which make sense, but you cannot justify with the starting point you had. So you have to go back and add another or more elements to your starting point and to justify what you just encountered. But then a few rounds later you find yet again another one, mm -hmm. which you can't justify, so you have to add more. So the old dream of having a base upon which you can build forget it because it is safe and sound and never to go back, is shattered. You have problems in the present which you cannot relate to an origin, whether temporal or ideal. So that's what Gödel calls incompleteness. You cannot close the definition of the present because each time you define the present in any possible way, each time you define the parties, <coughs> Or which way we understand what sexuality, how it works, or whatever, or what's Britain, or what's a nationality, 
you always have more varieties that are, you encounter at some point. So that definition is not stable. It's incomplete. And that, it, it, what Gödel was able to do, I, I don't understand the emails of the mathematical demonstration, but what he was able to do was to pull it from the inside mathematics. Mm -hmm. So it was mathematics that just threw up as a candidate. It was not a matter of opinion from outside. Okay, now, rest for a second, because there's a lot to take in. What makes sense to you in this little bit? What are you hearing? Because after this moment, we're then going to go on a little ride to art. But you, I just want to make sure you've gotten this under your belt, as it were. What are you thinking, Lily? What are you hearing? Uh, but yeah, I think it's beginning to make sense. The, the um, well, the fact that it can't be there can't be a definite, finished definition. That it's, there's always that there's always other factors to factor in, so that moving away from the need of a, a closed system, which kind of closes off the, the, the ability of re or reality or conception of reality to, oh no, I don't think that's but the right word. But why, why all this turmoil? <coughs> why all this, like, you know, narrow, monobrow, sweating over these concepts, you know, trying to, to come up with, well, it's not to be completed. Because then we can find, I mean, it's understanding, sorry. <laughs> Understanding, what, I mean, I suppose if, if they've then, in a sense, proven that meaning is, that there is no meaning, or that it's pointless, the search for a definite meaning is pointless because there is no way of going to that definite moment. So that there's always oh, that, that the only. Do you think God is involved with this? Surely. Because God is the answer, because that, that's, that, that, that's where divinity comes in, when, when we stop knowing, when, when human reason stops. The easiest thing is then to step to something which is beyond our understanding, and that's divinity. So, do you think that uh, Deleuze and um, Gödel and I don't know the whole crowd that we've been on? Do you think they're like deeply religious? No, no. So, so in what what, what, what happens with God if you follow the logic here? It's discredited. <laughs> it's discredited. <laughs> yeah, it's bad credit anyway. <laughs> 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 it's going to be hauled up before um, the board. That's right. <laughs> I think that, I mean, to drill it to God, um, God becomes um, animated to, to being a matter of a reason or a concept. It doesn't necessarily discredit, it, it discredits ideas of God, um, but I, um, certainly, definitely. And that's why Zen, people to go back to Zen, this is why Zen was, 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 a, was a non system, a non belief, um, a no mind system. They, they couldn't, when asked, is there a God, is there a meaning of life, they thought they always responded choanically and their method of collapsing logic. Um, it Because um, what God becomes, or at least if you were to put that heavy word there, becomes a, um, a relative interrelated principle. It doesn't necessarily become discredited, but it becomes animated, I think. But that's my biased opinion. I'm cosmic as, like, as my friend would say. That's right. No, yeah. so, you know, what Deleuze says is that uh, in terms of God, you look at Hanesha, the death of God, mm -hmm. he says if if God dies, then the human has to die also, because if hu humanity is put in that uh, position, it's still kind of um, it's still relative. So what would be happening is that they would just take the place of of God. So nothing would have changed. The same system still in place. It says nihilism has to go all the way right. to the point of humans humanity's own self destruction, and that is that that is it. So it's almost as though. Um, this, uh, if there is a kind of a... Is this like, you know, the suicide of humanity? Yeah. There's no. No, if there is no, no but, if there, <laughs> but if there is no kind of uh, answer, if it is kind of a... It's not... So close. So yeah. close. But we don't end up on the suicide of humanity. Yeah. So what it's, do the, we... it's the acceptance of the non-answer. It's the acceptance of the non-answer. Yeah. And why would determined. that not be human? Because it's easier to find a solution in God, for example. Or, I mean, it might be God or it might be something One else. One cannot know God. That's kind of the, the suggestion it makes. 
so many religious practices based their idea on the, I mean, if you look at Christianity, like, you know, various principles are, um, are about intuitively understanding a divine principle. This throws out the cloak out of the water, doesn't it? Because it, it suggests that any practice is a, um, is a practice of um, furthering a, a furthering a furthering an experience to to get you know it's not ne ne necessitated by God um, because the the, the 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 repeated questions um, I always think of Heidegger's um, question as a party of thought kind of thing um, it just means that you're you're continually pushing on you're not God isn't your God isn't your origin nor your end if you're going to put God in there it, it just becomes a, continu a, a continuity hmm. Heidegger. Surprise to Heidegger, he didn't realize he was being very Jewish there. That's hilarious, as an old joke. Um, okay, let's just put that on the table for a second, because that's good. Did you want to add any more to the Gödel thing? Because there's a little bit more to. Can you can you speak about it in relationship to, let's say, the lovely Gödel Escher Bach book? Like, why? What What do you think is What's the reason? What do you think is the reason we're looking at that book? Dang. You might as well get a little crazy. <laughs> this was the book that I think meant a lot to you. Mm, I think four years to read. That's right. Another book, like five pages of Yeah, it's a great book. Mm. Um. <laughs> Love the English. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> but in this, he highlights the idea of strange loops, which is prevalent in Gödel, Escher, and Bach. In Escher, you get the you know, the final picture that the rising yeah. waterfalls, but which return to where they That's are. That's in the very beginning. In which, but they don't return to where they are. But it's a return, but it's, it's not a place <coughs> where you're in a, you could say that the dimension has somehow shifted, so where you return isn't where you return, but you, uh, you, you've moved somewhere, but it's, you're back, sort of back, but you're not back. And yeah. And, uh, yeah, it did he actually publish another book later on titled I Am a Strange Loop? <laughs> trying to redefine the, the, the definition of, not the definition, but the description of intelligence in life. Precisely it is. And actually, I would be, make a wager that this is the basis of Henry, Lo, Henry, Henry, logics, Henry Rogers' logic on queer theory. This is the basis of this, this weird return that takes you out of yourself, but to put you exactly in yourself by taking you out of yourself and so on and so forth. So you have this like, yeah? Mm -hmm. It's because uh, I've been reading a lot of this also for my <laughs> work. But, um, yes. There is an example that is easier to grasp that joins the problem of what's arising, the incompleteness of the and the loop here. Yes. Um, if one thinks of um, any form of life, you can extend to the life on planet Earth. The life on the planet can exist on the life of what? The life on, on our oh, planet. Oh, planet Earth, right, 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 right. So we can say that to, I, to remain alive, I need to eat and to drink. And as long as I can eat and drink in the right amount, I have remain alive. And my life is this process of consumption. But it's not, I'm not starting to take my life from the idea that there is a soul, that is my core center, which would be ground concept that would be the starting point of which I am the representation. I am this consumption process. As long as the consumption works, I remain alive. I continue to be. I continue to be material here speaking. Then one can widen it and widen it and think the old planet, where the old planet exists and supports life because it is, it is consuming heat from the sun. And you can continue to widen this example, but the whole point is that there is a flux from outside, that which we always thought as having a boundary, my skin as a person, the planet as a sphere, and also the identity of this existence is not closed. It needs to receive energy and consume it. So in a certain way also let it go on the other side. 
And this cycle of consumption is what makes life, is what makes sense. A rhizome in the same way is not representing a concept or being rooted to the ground. So remember this. It is a combination of things that do find ways of exchanging temporarily, more or less long, stretches doesn't matter. So that something is, there is a form of coherence there. Something makes sense in, in this combination and continues to make sense as long as the combination lasts. So this is why there are these loops, this circularity. But if you subtract food and water from the ice, I will no longer be what I am. It can be an organic plant of matter, and then not even that, I don't know. But, but, so you, you, instead of starting to think from the point of Matthias as a soul endowed by whatever, you don't need to go back to a metaphysical thing. You think of it perpendicularly in a horizontal way, and you see all the phenomena, all the, the um, symptoms put together make the surface, which is me, the strange loop I am. And it's because there's this continuous consumption open at both ends, or actually much more than both ends, open throughout. So it is, it becomes <coughs> a very permeable form of definition that one has, constantly on the verge of instability, incomplete for good or metastable for thermodynamics or, and so forth, or a bit queer. And you see, this is the sort of the core aspect of what it is to be alive. Let's go like this. I mean, I'd like to use the word human, but I don't care. It's not no problem. Alive yeah. in this time period. This is postmodern or modern or something, because usually in either religious text or very specific cultural text. Certainly, I'm sure everyone in this room has had experiences where you've been tried to be melded into one way, and what, for whatever reasons you've rebelled or you haven't rebelled, but anyway, you've had these issues that you have to go on, to find that what becomes normal, let's say, or what becomes usual is this realization that you are a strange loop. But the, the recurrence doesn't take you back to some point in the back, although it might grab some of that. It takes you forward. The, the movement is like that. So if there's nothing else you get out of this course, you get the sense of the way in which the undecidability is the feature of humanity. But that doesn't mean insecurity, though it could lead to insecurity. It doesn't mean can't make a decision, though it could lead to no decisions. It means that there's always some room for maneuver. And because of that, there's an instability. And that's what makes one alive. Is that fair enough? Yes. Also, I'm thinking if you, another nice image is uh, Louis Carroll, the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland, who needs to keep running and do all the things just to be on time to do the things she needs to do, so she's running on the spot yeah. and doesn't get anywhere. She just runs to remain where she is, as if the, the soil would be moving backward. Huh? Yeah. So there is this idea that one, it, 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 what, what, to go back to the question we started the, the seminar with, of what's a rhizome? A rhizome is, can be a concept, but it is not the representation of the concept. It's mm -hmm. not pointing at something that is its definition. It is what it is, and it generates possible continuous morphing definitions, but it does not express it well. It, it is the definition, and that changes. If, if you think of what art is, mm -hmm. one of said art is mimetic, so you want to make a good painting of the landscape. And then from that on, all the variations, and we, we still have this thing we call art, and yet, it can change every time we have something new to it. Or we lose something from it, because we no longer do landscape painting, as, as they were doing in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. And yet it is, because we go to it, we want to make it, we want to go to see shows, we want to read about it, think of it, we suffer for it, we frustrate it if it doesn't work. But that, so it exists, it's alive in its own way, it is. But there isn't one fixed definition we can, we can always go back to. There isn't an axiom that can describe what it is. David, what are you hearing or are you typing? 
Because what are you hearing? That, that's fine. Uh, I feel kind of battered to death, really, in a good way. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I've caught you on that. Yeah. Here's what the students think about this course. I feel battered to death, but in a good way. Yeah. Um, This is, it's tough stuff, it, trying to get your head around it. Mm. But you will get your head around it. Or death. Being a strange loop. Cake or death. Fred? Well, I have been listening, but then I, I just kind of got to thinking, you know, something just spurred off in my mind. I mean, he's talking about Escher, and he is a MC Escher, isn't he? Yeah. And then I got to thinking whether there is a DJ that exists who goes by the name of MC there Escher. Is. And just plays loops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure there is actually. Yeah. Right? There's, I think there's an MC Escher. But you see, in that's, itself, that's that hilarious. Is a, is a combination that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And it's not the expression of anything you could think of before. But as it has happened, now we can talk about it, comment it, and it expands. And then, so this goes back to it's quite interesting what we were talking to uh, about in uh, Erica's Erica, lecture yeah. uh, and these kind of Google. Uh, simulated searches and how kind of interesting they are like uh, if you just put in MC along with Escher you get reams and thousands upon millions of uh, different DJs so now he enters into that relationship with DJs yes. obviously don't think so far removed but there is still a, a connection there yeah and I think that's interesting no absolutely no, it's, it's fantastic so what else in this book did you grab and then we'll take a break so just you can finish it because then I, what, what I want us to do when we come back, if you're sold, you know, sort of ticking over a little bit, have some coffee, um, is to see how this works with your work, with your own artwork. And, and what I'd like Matia to do is to show the um, little film clip that you sent, that map, oh, yes. the Genesis <laughs> thing, which I think we, we, we quite. Play it again, but I don't know. Okay, yeah. Right yeah. But anyway, can you just say, okay, the strange loops is the main thing. Mm. Um. So, let's use an example. We use the Bach in here. The Bach's work uses a very specific structure of notes, which bring, always brings one, one back to the note which started the whole movement, and that in turn allows the movement to sort of carry on. It holds a sort of attention in it, which allows things to continue moving along. Bach's very mathematical in how he structures his musical. How uh, he movements. Things have to cohere and make sense in this always returning and very slight variations on movements <coughs> allow differences to, to emerge in it. Mm -hmm. um, and again, half slightly relates that back to Zen, you're thinking about does, does a dog have Buddha nature? Mm -hmm. But if you if that statement becomes decidable as yes or no, you lose your own Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. So it's holding on to this Zen without giving it away, throwing it onto something else. Now, you have to keep it, but you have to keep moving along with it as well. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know how to do Tai Chi? Does anybody ever do any Tai Chi? So, so, you know, when you have the movements and you're catching something with the wind or whatever, you move with it, right? You move with what you're, anything that's being thrown at you, you, you go with it, you know, so that you end up being able to incorporate it and sort of, you know, I'm sorry people, I know this is terrible, but as I've mentioned before, I think I mentioned it last semester and I'll mention it this semester, but a great movie that you really should watch is the is the second version, not the first one, the second version of Karate Kid, uh, with Will Smith's son in it. What is it called? Karate Kid. Oh, Karate Kid, yes. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I love thought this you were joking. No. You thought you were joking. No, sadly not. You know, um, you can never be too old or too young to watch Karate Kid. Okay, so you have to watch Karate Kid because one of the things that uh, the poor kid learns is how to move like this snake. It's, it's, he goes, climbs a mountain, as you do, you know, um, and he learns how to do this kind of mirroring of a certain image, because he's catching, it's not that he's reflecting the image, he's catching the image, 
But you'll see when you go watch it. <laughs> what were you looking for? There is a photograph that I started putting in Emma's terms of uh, a circle of people that are sitting on each other's knees. Oh, yeah. And obviously, nobody is sitting on a chair. They are all sitting on each other's knees and they sit and they are solidly resting, and calmly resting down. And it's completely self-supported. You can imagine what, what I mean. Can mm. you imagine living with Escher? Shall we try it? <laughs> yes, yeah. shall we try it? Just Many a drama class is dedicated <laughs> to attempting that. <laughs> That's right. No, he, of the manages. It's a photography on I have a strange look. Yeah, yeah. It. And uh, it's very interesting because it depicts how you can have out of things that are independent and uh, not, not acting as chair, you can have a solid sitting situation that supports itself in the circularity, rhizomatically, because it's combinating something. It, no person is a chair, so there is a, mm -hmm. a heterogeneous combination of this taking place. And yet, everybody manages to sit mm -hmm. comfortably, or well, manages to sit, and the structure becomes solid. It's not that they have to stand to do anything. It's, they stand, but they stand, they sit like that. So it's very interesting how you can pass from things that were not meant to be together without the concept of it, and yet you get something that stays together. Uh, why don't we just begin a little bit, and then uh, Dora will come in, and I'll be fine. Um, so where we are at the moment, is we're inching our way slowly onto the business <coughs> sand and to this understanding of the undecidable this understanding of uh, how intensity operates and so on. So because Natia has been uh, asked to do nothing other than his PhD, as a result he sends me these little videos that have, <laughs> that have to do with this course and other things that he's thinking about. Not so much unrelated to your PhD because it is related to your PhD. PhD yes. yes, yes. Okay, <laughs> so do you want to explain this? Well, this is something I received. Can you all see this? From okay. the it's, it's worth watching it first and then talking about it. Okay, so this is in relation to what we're reading, okay? It's a, it's a, it's a work of an artist, is, so that's also important. <coughs> They have had better lighting in the second part of the film.
Very yeah, very. Why? Why? Why do you say that? Well, they they kind of. I've I've seen a bit of it before, really uh -huh. recently, but they they're kind of having a lovely time on the beach, and they seem to get a personality, and then they get wet, and that's a bit sad, and and then one of them kind of falls out, and they say, oh, <laughs> they've given up, and the you know, and the and the Jack in the background, you know. I. Saw this and I thought, God, wouldn't that be brilliant to drop these from planes in war zones yeah. instead of bombs? And they just all sort of be walking around and <laughs> freak people out. <laughs> I just thought, that's working on. Um, Do you know that um, uh, when when LSD was discovered, they were developing it as a as a as a as a gas as a weapon destruction, so that they could actually. Gas the enemy to make them go insane. Kind of a one idea, but. And instead, they invented the counterculture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, that's right. Good old Alvin. <laughs> so, what made you connect to this? Like, oh. The best part of it. The beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. So you can see it. Mm. Well, what I found interesting is, is that they have all the symptoms, and I underline the word symptoms, of um, animated motion, mm -hmm. and yet they are not alive. However, from what Jazz just said, even if we have empathy with them, okay, the music may be helped, but yeah. there is a melancholy from the fact that there are these big animals, because obviously they are shape of some sort of organic stuff. So, sort of horse, uh, dinosaur, <laughs> way, <of> this <laughs> big skeleton, Worm, yeah. these big skeletons that walk about, and yet they, they, you can see that the, the, the mechanism is hollow, there isn't an engine, yeah. it is the wind that makes them move. Really? So they are dissipative uh -huh. structures in that sense, like <coughs> what I was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you have all of these signs of life, well, they look like they are alive. Mm -hmm. So, what does it? This is going then going back to, to the, the name. <laughs> um, 
Turing. Turing, yeah. Mm -hmm. What does make the difference between something that is alive and not? Because those things move exactly like live, so such a live organic things. They are obviously built to, look, to, to move like that. But that's why it is clever, because you can actually have this semblance of life without anything but plastic tubes and the wind that pushes them. And it becomes even more evident when they are pulling that other grey water, mm -hmm. that other grey like structure. Yeah, a little dragonfly, a mm -hmm. little large dragonfly. Mm -hmm. When there is a big structure, just they are pulling, so you don't even have the, the magic of the wind. You see that it is enough to add some force from outside yeah. to make it look like it is an organic structure that functions by itself. Mm -hmm. Now, whether the force from outside is a physical push of the two tires and pushing it for the food intake mm -hmm. is a variation. It's kind of incredible that they didn't get washed away at sea. They actually, apparently, they do. And do do they? One of, one of his problems is that they push the boat. Yes. And they made of plastic tubes? Yes. Oh, I thought it was bamboo. No, I can see. Maybe, so, maybe so what made need... you think about this? Because you said this with respect to morphogenesis and what we're doing. Well, precisely, I was thinking more of, of the Turing test for life, but, or, or um, the, 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 the Hofstadter, uh, uh, where you have a loop. And in this case, the loop is the wind and the structure. You have a semblance, an appearance, a symptom that is exactly the same as if that would be a big animal. So, and a live thing. I see how these forts. Mm -hmm. Do you know they succeeded the Turing test a few weeks back? Did they? Yeah. What, what do you mean? Um, the, the Turing test, um, the so one... You, the computer wants a yeah. thing with the jury on top. Um, Sorry? No, no, the... Um, the <coughs> um, to, a study whereby a, a computer imitates a human um, and um, over 50% over ratio of it, it being decidedly more human than machine, but actually machine. So mm -hmm. it can it they it, it, after so many years since he actually invented this so-called Turing test, they've actually succeeded in doing it. Over mm -hmm. so it's kind of like this. It has a semblance of life, but not actually human. Well, the uh, one of the things that's let's say interesting about uh, learned behavior by uh, computers or is, is precisely how I mean, if this actually had a computer in it that was learning as opposed to um, um, uh, <coughs> that, let me see if I can find something uh, where, um, where the, the structure learns So the question was how to um, so we do it this way. I'm not be able to uh, show you this way don't have it. Here it maybe is it. <coughs> Especially, I'm going to discuss mechanisms of life and learning and their relation Hopefully with the morphogenesis of different mm -hmm. structures. Uh, so, um, just mm -hmm. okay, no. which is domain. <laughs>
this is the kind of stuff I want to get into. Let's hope they're going to give you one. Intelligence is many different things. Think about chess, for instance. Computers can already beat humans at chess, but chess is a game that's gone by a few rules and is played on a board with only 64 squares. Our world is not like that. We don't live on a chessboard. Our world is unstructured and the possibilities are endless. In our robotics research, we try to bring artificial intelligence into the real world, and that's a completely different game. We don't often think about our everyday activities as requiring any form of intelligence, but still, doing anything in the real world, such as moving around without bumping into anything, is very hard for robots to do. Still, insects have managed to do it all the time. I'm sure this is going to... Yeah, at Vida, our approach is to try to solve the complex network problems by using small robots, simple robots. Instead of trying to mimic human intelligence, we take inspiration from the observation of social insects, such as ants and bees. In social insects' colonies, individuals might be very simple, but when they work together, they can do remarkable things. Here we see a group of ants working together to transport an object much too heavy for a single ant. The key principles from robotics is that lots of simple robots following simple rules can carry out complex tasks. Having swarms of simple robots gives you lots of benefits. The robots can work in parallel. While some of the robots are doing one task, the other robots can be performing another task entirely. The system is also robust to failures. If some of the individual robots fail, the rest of the robots can keep carrying out the task. Our robots don't quite resemble ants, but they can move around independently, and they can also grab onto each other. This ability gives the swarm a type of flexibility, because by gripping each other in different ways, the swarm can form different shapes. This is morphogenesis. In our research, we try to mimic the intelligence of insect swarms. Although our robots cooperate closely with each other, there is no central brain guiding them. This means that each robot has to act individually. The robots communicate by lighting up in different colors. The problem is that the robots can only see each other when they're very close to each other, and the image processing they do is very basic. We came up with a small set of simple rules for each robot to follow. For example, when one robot lights up in blue and green, the other robots try to grab it. When all the robots follow one rule set, they grow into a particular shape. By changing the set of rules, we can grow different shapes. Be afraid. Working, using morphogenesis as a way for robots to adapt to their surroundings. If, for example, those rules can be taken at random. In this case, it seems that they are planning. Yeah, planning something. So there is an outside intention that is more or less teleological in quotation marks. Instead, in whatever the random starting point might be, as soon as connection is possible and it's repeatable, then maybe it becomes the step for another connection, just a bit more sophisticated to take place. Because it you know, really becomes a step on which more can happen. And that's what, what is happening there with the connection between those things. Uh, let me show you one other thing. Let me show you if, if you find it something. Do you find this? Say hello to the all-new Galaxy S7. Oh. It snaps pictures like a pro. Yeah. 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 Let's you have memory of the story than your photos. Yeah. And it keeps up with your life. Sorry. It does all this and still turns heads. This one is actually interesting. The all-new Galaxy S7 from Samsung. Two things I want to show you guys. You know this TV, Cold Fusion. Hi, welcome to another Cold Fusion video. So far in Cold Fusion videos, we've seen how the field of robotics is starting to develop AI to the point where an extremely limited situational consciousness is possible. Obviously, this is just the beginning, and things.
things will drastically improve. But with that being said, there's a major problem here. What if a human instructs a robot to do something that could harm the robot, another human, or is just morally wrong? How does the robot decide what to do? In this video, we'll take a look at some cutting edge research that is beginning to solve this problem. Firstly, let's take a look at some video footage of some early tests from researchers Gordon Briggs and Matthias Schultz at Tufts University Human Robotic <laughs> Interaction Lab. Do you have a name? start understanding these really basic things we've been talking about, which you know at the moment are so difficult to sort of understand, these feedback loops, these you know, undecidability, these are all ways in which artificial intelligence is made to happen. And uh, and they are connected with art and with thinking and with creativity, which is kind of mind blowing when you think, you know, on the one hand it's intensity, it's I mean, I can't find the one that I really wanted to show you, which is, I mean, uh, it's a, CB, a BBC uh, production that was on, it was basically on how robotics learn in 11 steps. So you have this uh, 
computer program and the, the image or the, the entity runs into a wall and then realizes the next time that they're facing a wall that they have to turn right. And then, so they always turn right, and then they realize that if they keep turning right, they'll go in a circle, and so on. So, so they start realize, and then they start thinking outside the pattern. And when they start thinking outside the pattern, that's when you get into this very specific kind of intelligence that uh, you see in CGI films and you see in these various things. But it's you know obviously mainly taken up in the military right now, um, and a few art. I mean, the kind of art pieces that we just saw when they start bringing in the morphogenesis at the um, at the computer level, at the AI level. I mean, really interesting things can happen, really scary things can happen. And I wanted to just open that out so that you could get a sense of what was going on without bringing in the whole ideological move. Obviously, you can see the horrors of what can happen. Um, but you can also see, you know, there's, you know, and robots are also don't happen to look like that. In fact, if you're in the know, you don't call it a robot, you call it a bot. Um, and the bots, don't have to have bodies, they can be gelatins, you know, so there's little things that you can put on tables or whatever. They're very big right now in uh, trying to develop situations for people who are profoundly disabled. These gelatins can be used to um, open windows, turn on toasters, you know, whatever. It's not a totally different kind of circuit. You can like, look at them, breathe, have a certain um, uh, bra brain wave link, and so on. In order for you to understand this, in order for you to make sense, a dialectical approach would never take you there. And this may or may not help you to understand the importance of why we try and get out of metaphysics in this way. But it is as relevant to the military as it is to art, what's going on right now. Which is why I think it's important for you to begin to grasp, even if it's just a tiny smidgen of how this operates, how dimensions are are setting the agenda, or curves, or um, different kinds of ways in which one isn't just if this go that way, if not go this way. There's different feedback loops that produce, in fact, the if this then that, if not then this. Hence, you can a computer can beat the system. Any questions? Any any upbeat any comments you'd like to make? Yeah. Can I add one thing? This is going back to, to the hope that Gordon shattered. Yeah. The, idea, the hope that what? The, the Gordon shattered with his group. Of oh, right, yeah. If the, the one thinks from the point of view of having some axioms and then calculating everything from now, so that a priori, all the way to the future, everything is predictable these kind of things would not be possible. Because this rests precisely on the fact that every so often, or at each step actually, there is some room for expansion, the technical term is emergence, which adds to what was already there. Life could not have emerged if everything would have been as static as 2 plus 2 plus 4, then 8, then 16, and it, just, it would be flat. No, no, no possibility to hook something onto it. Instead, it's because there is some imprecision. That not imprecision in the terms of weakness of understanding, but because the system is open, it allows more than what is started with. That both the emergence of life and intelligence, and artificial intelligence, is possible. So, for example, when the robots or the little bots see blue, they're not actually seeing blue and saying, ah, oh, yes, that's blue, I'm going to go work with blue. There's no cognition in that sense. But at the same time, there's a way in which the patterns connect. And that's what is part of this move of trying to understand how then consciousness comes out of this. Actually, that's where it's pushed. So, um, I'll show one more video. <coughs> Does anybody, has anybody ever heard of Asimov? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go on, speak. Yeah. <laughs> what? It's okay. No, what are you going to say? Oh, he is pronounced 
So for those of you that haven't seen, I mean, I've actually been to Japan and was introduced to a single. Uh, is that, mm -hmm. I, I've heard of us, uh, but I didn't, uh, is, yeah. that's obviously more than one, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Actually, there's a better, there's even a better one than this one. Hold on. That looked like there's somebody in it. Mm -hmm. I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little guy The first time Albert Einstein locks eyes with you, it can be an intense experience. The super-realistic Einstein robot, an emotionally intelligent machine modeled after the famed physicist, can track your eye movements, respond to audio cues, and mimic your facial expressions, much like a real human. The head and shoulders automaton was built at Hanson Robotics in Texas, and it uses 31 internal motors to evoke expressions of happiness, sadness, anger, fear, or confusion. But what makes Einstein seem so human is its software, developed by scientists in the Machine Perception Laboratory at the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology at UC San Diego. Lab director Javier Movian developed the software that allows the robot to recognize facial expressions on people around it. The software allows Einstein to observe and understand human stimuli and to respond in a relatively natural way. It even recognizes facial cues suggesting age and gender or whether the person interacting with it is wearing glasses. The robot's parallel facial action coding system can also detect simple gestures like knots and mimic those reactions. Scientists are hoping to use the Einstein robot to better understand the interaction between humans and robots. It could also be used as a platform for entertainment, fine arts, cognitive therapy, and even education. Indeed, the UC San Diego scientists already have plans to deploy the robotic head in a high school classroom to see if learning from Albert Einstein himself might be one way to engage teenagers more fully in physics, math, and other sciences. Incredible, isn't it? Mm. Does he talk, or does he just... Yeah, he does. Know? I mean, not in that one, obviously, but... <laughs> yeah, go ahead. In a lab in Korea, researchers are developing machines that can move like man. The most spectacular achievement so far? Robert Cubo. <laughs> the dramatic effect, they gave him an Einstein head. They made its face animatronic so that it can form expressions. And they gave it a voice. Hello. Very nice to meet you. Very <laughs> <laughs> German Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> That's <is> so creepy. Would want to say that they had bed, would you? This is Albert Hubo's creator, Professor Jun Ho Oh. He's director of the Hubo lab at KAIST, one of Korea's biggest research institutes. Hubo is short for humanoid robot. And for now, the focus here is not on creating smart robots. I'm not sure what that. What do you think? Should I do it? It's on developing mobility and stability, so robots can walk on two legs and move into our world. Eventually, uh, such kind of human robot should help human in real life environment. But that is ultimate goal. Professor Oh wants to build the world's most advanced humanoid robot. Because Keist is an institute of learning, he has students to help him. Uh, 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 until the he has students to do line. his work. Because <laughs> Professor O was on a mission to beat the competition. Asimo, the world's most famous humanoid robot built by rival nation Japan. Asimo can climb stairs. He can run. It's taken on to almost two decades <laughs> and untold millions to build it. Not easy, because walking on two legs is actually quite a feat, even for humans. Oh dear. The uh, <laughs> human, for example, is naturally unstable. If human is stand up, stand just uh, stand up without <coughs> any the um, active control, he will fall down. Hubo, if he is a stand up with single leg, it is very unstable. So without some active regulation of his posture, then he will naturally fall down. The walking means that you are falling down again and again and again. 
Which is the Lori Anderson song, by the stability way. Stability walking time and forward. While you are walking. Mm -hmm. So that kind of thing is not trivial for the robotic system. Professor Ohl began his mission to beat Osimo in 2002. He bypassed most of the R&D Honda went through by keeping things creative and simple. His team used off-the-shelf components, built others from scratch. Most important, they reduced a robot's step to its basics, and they ran tests again and again to build algorithms, complex mathematical formulas that give robots their stability. It, just like same as humor, when you're born, you practice first, you fall down, and you learn eventually. We did the same thing for the robots. In all, it's taken $2 million worth of research to get this far. Now, when Albert Hugo moves, a gyroscope in his chest measures the motion of the upper body. In the legs, sensors measure forces and angles, and everything works together. So the system has continuous, automatic control of where the center of gravity is. When the stabilization is turned off, you can see the effect. When pushed, Albert Hugo sways. When the stabilization is turned on, he pushes back and rights himself. Remote controlled by a laptop, the robot can walk forwards and backwards. Give you an idea. Mm -hmm. And in a pre-programmed pattern called an S-curve. Albert Hubo has yeah. independent control of each finger. So but what they're not showing you, the reason they're trying the right one, is how it learns, how, how those robots or bots actually learn without being programmed to learn. So one is programming, so you actually say, if you do this, then you'll do that, if you do that. But now that the computers beat, like the playing of chess and so on, it's not because they've gone faster and faster through all the combinations of, of what you can do. They actually have learned in the process of doing this move. So the feedback loop creates, it, it goes back to the sort of position, but with a lot of things with it. So it's, it, it increases its knowledge. And increases its knowledge laterally and dimensionally. Can it, can it be really called learning? Yes. Yes. Why? Why? What? Just what? like uh, when the brain is having yes. all the. Yes, learning. Mm. Why do you Scary. think? Why do you think that's? Why should it? Why <coughs> should you think the word shouldn't be used. Uh, because I think uh, there is a, a, a bit of difference with how mm. humans. Learning. But that's how we learn. Yes. Well, not, not exactly. The, 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 what was very difficult to take is that the paradigm must be turned around. It's not that a computer quasi learns because it's a machine. It's that one has to think of our learning as a machine learning as well. It, you have to undo the notion that there is consciousness as something solid. Mm -hmm. And then you understand that it is a system of encountering and feeling back to the encounter. And if that repeats fast enough, long enough, of all the possible points we have, then you have a person that replies to you as you expect. And whether it is made of synthetic materials or organic materials, it matters rather little. And these problems were already actually done Wittgenstein in, in the, from the 30s to the 50s, the discussing is just about the interaction with language, so it wasn't yet going to um, um, machines, in a sense. I was describing the meaning of language as receiving the, the answer you expected, or, or mm -hmm. something that fits with your expectation, and the repeatability of that, so that you know, whatever has been said can go on and you receive them replicated in the same way. So that already changes under 180 degrees, the notion of consciousness as inte and intelligence. Because you don't start from I am, you start from all the relations. So mm -hmm. th th that brings us back to the horizon we started from. Which is the encounter. Right, yes. so, <coughs> yeah. so uh, that starts back to hopefully start connecting you to your work, to your own work. And how your work becomes features of encounter. You may not know, you don't know in advance what it is you're trying to do. But when it's done, it makes sense. Yeah, Fred? Oh, sorry. Did I say something? Yeah, I'm sorry. 
was wondering, have you watched that uh, film yet? Which called one? Uh, Ex Machina. I think I, uh, I think I... Yeah, I did, I did see that. Yeah, that's, yes, yes. Sh do you want to, want me to put this on? Sure. Put, yeah, a trailer what, or something you, on YouTube. Once you find it on YouTube so you can see it. Yeah. Um, can what? What the Scarlett Johansson? No, uh, that's, that's her. Yeah, that's good too. But it's, yeah, something different, but... Equally, yeah, interesting. Yeah, but that's about that's robotics that? is consciousness that rather than yeah. all like living. But yeah, but, but that's the next. That's just human yeah. intelligence within. And there's also, of course, saying nothing. The later version of Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> just again, I know nobody watches television in this room, but if you have a chance, I'm, I'm sure they have old episodes on on uh, YouTube. Battlestar Galactica. The very last season was very disappointing, I felt. But before that, with all the different <coughs> um, bots going around and falling in love and doing whatever they're doing with themselves, it's not uninteresting. Okay. Yeah, this one right. Right. The, the thing that... The stage we are in, there is still there are still boundaries. The, the, it's not open ended, and that is what makes the ethical difference to, it, to me. Because I would expect that not everybody uploads to YouTube what they're cooking. So already you have a narrow window, <laughs> and and it, uh, one kind of. It's a very this is fantastic. I was not expecting that sentence. Yeah, it's a very, very <laughs> narrow window of kind of cooking. Not all the cuisines of the world, not all the styles, 
some people of a certain age, someone who's 90 probably is not, not thinking that they will put a new tube in their cooking, so grandmothers are out, all this. So you have. Master Chef is in. And, and the, you narrow the window. And then, I got again. So you have a very specific model of what is becoming the model for learning. So much for the for the military robot at the time, mm -hmm. at the moment. They are certainly not told how to cook, for example. <laughs> yeah. So there is, that's very interesting. And it's probably just a, a time span in change. But at the moment, it's an area where the, the finite measure of information that is passed to, to an artificial intelligence still counts for what is becoming. Well, while well, I try and find that on YouTube, can you explain? Oh, we're going to ask you I was going to ask her, what is to be said of improvisation? Because uh, naturally, the, uh, the parameters for the robot would be to, yeah, they can only assimilate what they've learned on YouTube. Now, the question would be, what? Where does that transfer mm -hmm. start to happen? Can they start putting ingredients together that they know, or supposedly know, from what other people have put together? Yes. Will I mean, work. That, that's what the scary thing is, or that's what the profound thing is about the robot that beat the chess player. Because the robot doesn't have all the information about all the moves, and, he's just, and, and it's just going through the machinations of trying to find the thing, it has learned what is the next move. But truly, mm -hmm. that learning is improvisation, because you try something, you get to an obstacle, and you have to do something you've not done before in order to overcome it, so you have mm -hmm. to improvise. That's a nice way of putting that. But, yeah. but, uh, yeah, but can't improvisation but fail as well? When, like? when yeah, it can, of course, but that's a learning process, because you try, oh, yeah. and you try until you get it right, but you have to keep trying new things, which is improvising, because you you're in a situation where you have to put something new into practice which hasn't been when done before, right? When you bought, uh, um, um, what was the chess player, uh, the Russian one? Oh, uh, mm, Karpov. Uh, Ka uh, can yeah. Oh, Kasparov. Kasparov. In the 90s, it was sheer ability to calculate ahead all the possible movement of the chess game. Really? When last week some Chinese was beat by a computer by the computer at a game, I can't remember the name of a very complex uh, game. Backgammon. Backgammon. That was. Oh no, it was backgammon. Go. 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 That, yeah. that was interpretation and choice. Yeah. I find that this. Here we go. Okay, good. Actions of manipulation by processing videos from the internet and representing the form such that a robot can perform these actions. In this cooking video, the woman is adding mustard to the bowl. The vision process is first to detect the hands and classify the hand grasps seen on the left. Other processes detect the objects, here the mustard in the left hand and the bowl in the right hand seen on the right. To find the verbs, the spread and the stir, additional language processes are employed. With this information from vision, the action grammar builds the action tree, action as shown at the bottom left. On the bottom right, you see the equivalent information in standard predicate form. The robot now, using this representation, can perform the actions. The robot has learned beforehand how to perform the actual movements of actions with its own body. They want Do you know eat? anyone? <laughs> <coughs> After having added the tomatoes, it grabs the mustard with the left hand and spreads it over the bowl. <laughs> the robot in its right hand carries a camera with which it tracks the location of the bowl. Then the robot picks up a spoon and stirs the contents of the bowl. Well done, Julia. That's oh, hardly yeah. cooking. <laughs> <laughs> what about the test? Oh, yeah, really. The test is in the eating, obviously. And they eat it. And they test it. But anyway, just so you know, so you can see that.
I can't believe that doing it. Well, it, well, the first question would be why, but then the answer is because we can. Yes, yes. And then that's like a, but that's we're not thinking the about housewife. the moral implications of any of this, which is just insane. Well, well one of the things yes. that uh, when my mother was very ill and she was in hospital, um, cancer actually, there in the U.S., and this was in 2002, so this was a while back. Uh, the military hospital, she was in a military hospital, uh, had uh, robots delivering the um, medicines. And they look like little vacuum cleaners, actually. They look like one of those, like, Mr. Henry's that <laughs> go around. And it was like, and they'd go into the room and then they, you know, go into the pouch and then... And, and, and so I said, you know, have you ever had a mistake? Which seems to be the obvious problem, that you go into the wrong room. And they hadn't admitted to it. You know, uh, and but how uh, can they check? Yes, I've got a video to show. Okay, and it's yeah. This wasn't what we were going to talk about tonight, but yeah. okay, yeah. we're good. I find that there's a problem with my own head about all this. Okay. <laughs> if you consider the constant development of, if we think of beginnings, because I know that's a horrible word in this case, but if we think of the constant development of the beginning and therefore the end, constant change, the kind of um, developing constant development. Then, if we think of let's let, let's go back to the artist and then and, 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 and this I'm wrong words. And think of the artist in Zen. In Zen, for instance, they employed the Khan and the method of collapsing logic for the purpose. They meaning a certain Buddhist. They being a Zen monster. Okay. Zen, Zen, yeah, so people were meditating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, masters. Okay. Um, there were concepts, even if they hate that word, such as the great doubt and things like that, to create satori or to spur satori. Wait, wait. Yeah. The people are hating the notion of concept because it implies in that usage a universality. Yeah, yeah, okay. sorry. So, I'm so, just, just you know. Yeah, so, yeah, and I'm, not I'm, a multiversality. No, no, but I'm just getting to the fact that okay. satori, despite its um, relativity in, in how it behaves, was ultimately an objective. And when I consider art, even if we consider the, the constant experimentation that's required and that makes it and all that stuff, I've heard and unlearned and understand everything since I don't misunderstand anything. And I know that purpose is in this sense completely redefined. But then my mind goes back. If what is to be said of then an idealization in the sense that if you wanted because these guys and they're, they're making recipes. They're making. They want a. They want a certain. They want the robot to walk. They're. They're doing things purposefully. They make. They're creating purposes. How they're doing it is interesting. How that's being achieved relates to us. But ultimately, there is a purpose. <coughs> there, there is no, Hate to say it. There is a goal. Um, and so, where novelty comes in, rhizomatically, we think about the combinations, the algorithms, the production of new algorithms. This being produced, but then. To produce new intentionalities, how does one? Can you see what I'm guessing at? In the well, sense, well, if I can reread or sort of the notion of telos, yes, doesn't go away. Yes, but that doesn't mean that it's the method. That no, just, no, no. You know, and so, but what I think you're worrying about, what I think you're confusing a little bit, is the telos is not the same thing as a feedback loop. No, 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 totally not. No, I, no I, but you might be thinking that because in a telos, you have the goal and it comes back around and gives the impetus to go forward. In an algorithm, in a feedback algorithm, you have a similar move in the sense that you have something happens, it increases and it's happening, comes back and forms a, a base that goes forward and then enlarges. And does anything smell like it's burning? No, okay, right? no, what, what, no, okay. what I'm... That's yes. a bit, I can... I'm I think so, sure because my bag... Might be the lamp. Well, what? yeah, that's what I was worried about. What, exactly. what, what, can, no, what really concerns good. me is that if, a, if an artist has an objective, um, let's say it's very simple, um, albeit, um, let's, say they're an, let's say they're an optimist and they want to spread the love, let's say, um, or let's say they want to spread the hate, who cares? Whatever objective they have, they have to create new forms of doing that. But the objective itself may remain the same. The feedback loop. I, I do understand what you're saying, but that isn't what I'm confused about. But the love is not necessarily an objective. The, object, the artist 
the objective, as it were, would be what one is producing. Yes. And to know in advance what one's producing is not going to produce what one wants to produce. No, but the effect, but they want the effect they want to produce remains the same. Well, not necessarily. Well, no, that, no, that's what I'm posing. The, 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 question. the question is different. That the, in a loop of this kind, yeah. or in a loop of this kind, it doesn't have to be that technological. Mm -hmm. I like to think of precisely as something that is far more uh, sensuous. Open, yeah. sensuous. The, the intention, or the telos, and the results diverge. As an artist, I want to work, because it gives yeah. me pleasure. And it ends there. Um, some might want to work because they become famous. It does, but the, that's not the product of the work. No, uh, no. The artwork comes out. It's, it's, they, they go like this. Mm. And in this, uh, in this case, you have a repetition that is open. So if what you want is to iterate that fact that you like to work, yeah. and this becomes genetic. Okay. Literally genetic as in organic and genetic, yeah. or mm -hmm. generative of things. Mm -hmm. and this is the way I see it. I mean, it's not, yeah, you know, the whole makes sense. Sort of, I have a question about creativity at this point. Okay, right. Because can a robot be creative? Well, it we means you start with zero. You something. probably know um, Steve Bullcock who also teaches on design, uh, his thesis is about how the computers produce art. Mm -hmm. And how? Well, it's a longer discussion, but I mean, so the short version <laughs> is yes. Short, like that, that screen thing. We have nothing to like do with yeah. generated yeah. color movement. Yeah. In fact, I think it's kind of funny that when you're walking down from Starbucks to the school, because there's such an argument that's going on about who owns that computer, we're not allowed to put anything on that computer that is about the School of Art. So instead what you see is this random pattern. Yes. But people have commented to me on the street going, it's so interesting what you do at the School of Art. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Because what they're seeing is like an apple. A screensaver. A screensaver. Anyway, show us what you're going to show us. Well, it is kind of ridiculous now after we've had that discussion, but uh, <laughs> maybe something a bit light-hearted just, oh, just to lighten the mood. <laughs> okay, robot. Smell and identify the objects. I obey. Lost, lost, cannot see, can only smell. Help, help, help. <laughs> cannot reach. Cheese. Brilliant. It works. <laughs> Cheese. <laughs> Flowers. Never mind, that's a cheap show. <laughs> petrol. It's actually petrol, but good. Petrol. What the fuck? Cheese. <laughs> petrol. <laughs> petrol. <laughs> Cheese oil! 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 C
to see how the different systems of thinking are not about what happens in your head only, or even ever. It is the tactility of grasping. It's the way in which the encounters happen. And that's what all of these different sort of entities are that we've been trying to deal with. Is how does this encounter work? How does it work in your work? And that it's not just an infinite amount of encountering. That, that you just encounter and that's just how it sets up. That there are patterns that go on that can then produce things like uh, like the the, this, the the artworks on the beach that look like large uh, animals and that people felt sorry for. Or the um, the robots in the war that people nobody felt sorry for, or, you know, depending on what, what your view is. Of course, they have very tiny ones now, too, as you know. If anybody's seen Minority Report or iRobot, any of these things are not that far from the truth. Interestingly enough. Any comments on this? Jez, you have a last word? Um, no. Well, I could, yeah, I, there was a video I was thinking of by an mm -hmm. artist called Jordan Wolfson. Okay, you might as well show that and then that will It's be very it. quick. Okay. This is the kind of robot art crossover. Okay, let's go this way. Does um, that mean that art needs to make robots for work with robots? What's it now? This does not mean that art needs, artists need to make robots or work with robots. Right. It's just the logic that is now working in that world, in that technology, is actually very similar to the logic yes. of art. Thank because you. it is an open one. Yes. Um, Deleuze um, mm -hmm. says that the plane of eminence. Oh. We're going to have to wait on the And that the plane elements only exist within philosophy. Mm -hmm. in, um, in his definition of uh, plane elements, he talks about mm -hmm. how it only exists in philosophy. Um, and he says, I don't know where, to be honest at this point, that art only um, that art imitates nature by doing what it can't do. So there's a paradox in my head for Deleuze, in the sense that, and I think of this logic, it does relate in my head, I don't know where, um, that um, for art, to be philosophical, as it were, um, why does it have to be? Um, surely Deleuze produces... Surely, surely Deleuze is wrong. Um, and, um, because if, I mean, if it, but wrong about what? But if, because if it only exists for philosophy, then it only exists for... If the plane of imminence only exists for yeah, philosophy. But um, you'd have to show me that quote exactly, because I don't... Yeah, know. Um, but it's not, I don't think that's... 
ever no, that could ever easy. be the intention because there's no exclusivity in, what, yeah. in the way that they that he constructs his arguments. That wouldn't doesn't no, sound that's like true. something he's saying. But he say. does he does separate philosophy and art though. He, well, he, he does it continually. He, 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 many times he'll say, so he'll use art to make his argument, but he'll say that art... I'll, 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 I'll cut the quotes yeah, and I'll send you an email. Yeah. I, I think yeah. that... Uh, I, I heard that nuance, but when it's separated from philosophy, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Yeah.